Guajardo. Uh, they uh, will be uh, talking with two uh, folks that know a lot about the art world in Mexico and beyond. Um, that would be Jack Rutberg, who has had a long-term love affair with Mexico. Um, as we've seen in his gallery on La Brea for many years, he spends a lot of time down there and knows the, uh, the history of it quite well. And then we have Linda Vallejo. She um, is going to be talking about um, a lot of her work, but she's got a new group of work called Datos Suajardos. Suajados? Sajados. How do I pronounce it, Linda? Sajados. Okay. okay, so, and then after the we, uh, Christina and Alex, do their interviews with Jack and Linda, we will have Suleiman Elizondo from Monterey, Mexico, and Jesus Alberto Flores from Collector Gallery, which is also in the region of Monterey, which is a, a big um, uh, government and education center of Mexico. Um, it is one o'clock on the West Coast and around three o'clock in Monterey, and where Alex is in New York, it's, uh, what is it, for? Okay, so I'm gonna uh, take it away, Christina and Alex. Um, okay, hi everybody, bienvenidos. Um, saludos a todos. We, I'm Alex, that's my colleague Christina over there. And um, we are so thrilled to share Mexico with you this afternoon. Um, I'm going to share my screen really briefly so that everybody can be on the same page with what we are chatting about today. So just a moment as I get that up. Um, thank you again for joining us. We are, this is one of my favorite places in the world. Not, I mean, I'm biased because I am Mexican myself, but one of my favorite places. Um, so since we are going to do a, a deeper dive into um, contemporary Mexico, I figured that the best place to start would be with um, some of the very earliest iterations of Mexican art and the, the three main civilizations that um, we talk about when we talk about main um, Mexican art in the very beginning. And I'm going to do it pretty briefly because we have other things that are more exciting than this ancient stuff to get to. But one of the first civilizations um, in Mexico was known as the Olmec peoples. And they were, uh, they were around, uh, before I actually get into it, I just want to make sure, can everybody see my screen okay? Is this we're doing good? Okay. Um, so the Olmec people were known for um, one of the big uh, artifacts from their civilization are these colossal heads. And it's kind of hard to tell, um, but these heads are about 10 feet tall and they weigh close to 40 tons. The largest example weighs 40 tons. A ton is 2000 pounds. Um, so this is the thing that they left behind from their civilization. And originally it was thought that perhaps these were depictions of deities. Um, however, the Olmec had a tendency to depict their deities with really exaggerated, gruesome features, snarling jaws and snapping teeth. Um, and you can see these features, these two individuals here are, are they're pretty normal looking dudes. Um, so that idea was quickly discarded and then um, the next idea was because of these helmet type things that it appears they're wearing, that they were ball players. Ball players in um, a number of Mexican early civilizations, pre-Columbian civilizations, were um, the game itself was considered a religious, a religious and ceremonial rite. And um, so the ball players, much like LeBron James today or Michael Jordan, were essentially gods. And um, the and that was why people thought because of the tremendous um, stature of these pieces the scale is so much bigger than life size so much bigger than human they thought that perhaps they were ball players but later it was decided that because they have such distinct features and they looked so different from each other um, that these are actually probably depictions of the ruling class and of elites at the time and that's why they made them so large um, one of the things that is not uncommon to the Olmec civilization is um, you find it in Western civilization as well, that kings are descended from God. And so lots of people in the Olmecs, uh, the Olmec civilization believed that their ruling class, their elites 
were also descended from gods. So that's why these are so large because they are emphasizing their link to gods. Um, the next slide, which obviously it's not going to do for me. <sighs> next please is the next um, major civilization that everybody is very familiar with is the Maya. Uh, the Maya civilization was in existence from about 250 BC, uh, I'm sorry, 250 CE in the common era, which is what people refer to um, AD now, uh, if you don't wanna center it on a, a Christian viewpoint. Uh, this is the stepped pyramid at Chichen Itza, the, um, the one of the largest sites uh, one of the largest cities of the Mayan civilization. This pyramid is um, not dissimilar from Egyptian pyramids, but uh, it is not expressly meant for bur burial purposes. Here, ceremonies were practiced, political leaders and the, the wealthy and ruling class met. Um, additionally, later on, the Aztecs, when they co-opted these cities and these sites, used them for some of their own religious rituals and rites, but this one, in Chichen Itza is dedicated to the Kukul Khan god, who is the feathered serpent who we all also know um, from the Aztec as Quetzalcoatl. So here, a super cool thing happens. Um, on, on the equinoxes, a snake can, can be seen descending down the stepped pyramids. Um, and over to the right of this slide, you can see that this is a depiction of the god Kukul Khan. Um, the Maya were extraordinary astronomers and mathematicians. And so all of the building and all of the sites that all of these ceremonial sites are directly linked to the sun and their interaction with the night sky. Um, we are also very familiar with the, um, well, we are also very familiar with what people sometimes incorrectly term as the Maya calendar. I know that a lot of people thought very recently that the world was going to end because the Maya calendar suggested it. The Mayans were cyclical people though, and they believed that once a phase ended, a new one would begin, a new sun, so to speak, which is just a new, a new phase that we were entering into, a new phase of life. It doesn't mean that the other one was over and everything, you can expect Armageddon and all that to rain down on you. Um, it's just a new phase has begun. The next civilization we're gonna skate right over to is the Aztec who were um, a, war, a warfaring people, a deeply religious people who were in existence up until the conquest by Hernan Cortes in the 1540s. Um, this is that calendar that I was referring to, that, that super famous calendar um, who is essentially it's a depiction of a lot, there are a lot of different theories that abound, but the, the thought process behind it is that um, this central figure here is their version of a sun god, Tonatio, and he lives right in here. And essentially he is, um, he essentially is the, the god that, um, he's, he's akin to Zeus in Greek mythology. He's the god from which all the other deities stemmed and to which everybody reported. So um, the Piedra del Sol from 1502 is another really tremendous example of um, iconographic artwork. Uh, the way in which the Aztecs uh, had sort of developed writing and hieroglyphics, very similar again to the ancient Egyptian peoples. It was a pictographic writing system. But this piece here, the Piedra del Sol is uh, I'm gonna read this really fast so that I get it right. It essentially explains the nature of the relationship between God and man. The Aztec elite used this relationship with cosmos and bloodshed often associated with it. Uh-oh. <laughs> to, maintain, to maintain control over the population and the sunstone was a tool in which that ideology was visually manifested. So everybody would be able to understand what these images meant. Um, so we have in one single piece, a depiction of Aztec history by a calendrical means. We have a depiction of religion. We have a depiction of their deities and of the ruling class. So um, this is my super, super fast 
overview of these tremendous societies um, contributions to Mexican art and um, from which a lot of other people have been incorporated and jumped off. And so now I'm gonna pass it over to Christina to talk about her little, um, talk about her historical aspect. Sure, and thank you, Alex. Um, I appreciate uh, I appreciate that introduction to pre-Columbian art, um, and it was it's it's there's so much history, and Mexico is a country rich with culture and history that we could spend hours and days um, talking about all of these things, specifically even the pre-Columbian art. But since we only have an hour, I will move forward here and just uh, briefly mention how I would I would sort of describe um, pre-Columbian art as the work, all art and objects that were um, that were created prior to Christopher Columbus's discovery or arrival to the New World in 19 and 1492. That's sort of the generalization, I guess. Sadly, it has to be put that way, but that's that's how it's described. And um, and then. From that point on, from 1942 on to about 1820 is a period called uh, the Spanish colonial period, which was um, when during the period of like European um, explorers coming over to um, not only Mexico, but throughout South America and discovering the lands and bringing with them a lot of their sort of culture and influences. Um, and particularly religion was a key uh, key factor and, and a key influence for, for them. And, and it's shown in their works because a lot of the works from this period, the 1700s, I'd say, to about 1820, they're all um, religious icons, focusing on religious icons. And particularly this, this work specifically, um, a Virgin de Guadalupe from 1700 is a, very common theme, not only the, the idea of the representing the Virgin, Virgin Mary, um, but also the Virgin de Guadalupe is symbolic to specifically to Mexico. And, um, and this work, unfortunately, because it was during a period of 1700s, we don't know who the artist is that, that uh, created it, but I just think it's a beautiful piece. And um, I, I find that it embodies the, the movement so well just because you're talking about how the importance of Catholicism and Virgin Mary involved with the cloak of uh, Saint, um, Saint Juan Diego uh, from 16th century, like um, sort of Mexican peasant. Um, and it is, it is supposed to be a, a, the depiction of a very sacred place um, of worship for the Aztecs. So I figured it was a good transition from, uh, from the discussion about pre-Columbian art. Um, and then uh, that is a quick overview. Uh, and then we can move on to the next slide, Alex, if you don't mind, um, which is a work by an artist that is probably one of the more famous um, Mexican artists, uh, I would say of the 20th century, Diego Rivera. Um, he is someone that, again, we could spend days talking about and was born in 1886 and um, he was born in a very Catholic family um, and was sort of raised to be extreme, you know, to, to be a pious Mexican and, uh, of course, revert when was fascinated by painting and studying art throughout um, his travels to Europe, he, he basically looked to the old masters for inspiration. And a lot of the works were from the uh, Spanish colonial period, in particular, something the work that's depicted here from 1913 that he did is called Adoration of the Virgin. Um, and it's interesting because it not only incorporates the theme of um, a Spanish colonial art, but it also is is showing um, hints of his exploration of the Cubist period or Cubism, uh, which he was exploring at the time while he was in Europe. He was very influenced by um, a lot of the Cubist artists, uh, Picasso, and uh, in particular, he befriended throughout. And he um, and he in this work sort of has both um, sort of showing how he's going back in time and reverting back in history as an example of Spanish colonial, but also incorporating the Cubist styles. Um, he, what's even more interesting is that in this, it, 
it is incorporating another um, key, uh, uh, I would say, uh, characteristic of his work, which is of people, to, of two people working and um, with baskets and what looks like it could be, I believe that is uh, fruit inside or perhaps it's bread, it's hard to tell. Um, but, but it's just the idea where he started from 1913, 1915, he was focusing on Cubism, but then at 1915, when the reaction to the Russian Revolution, he responded by focusing, by leaving Europe, going back to Mexico and focusing on Mexican culture and the Mexican people and sort of capturing everyday life and, and the common, I'd say, I hate using the word, but sort of the, the, um, the, 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 the common man um, or the, the uh, just the working class. Um, and so he, uh, if you go on to the next slide, Alex, here is an example. And I feel like Jack might be able to speak a little bit more about this one. Um, it, the work on the left, it's Diego Rivera, um, Teja, Tejadora Textil, or Weaver from 1913, and then Luz Gilando by Diego Rivera from 19, um, 1936. It was actually during the period of, I'd say 1934 to about 1936, where Rivera did an entire series focusing on weavers and, uh, and was fascinated by just the study of weaving and how it was a tradition that was passed from one generation to another. And in the, in the work on the left, you actually see in the background a, a faint image of a woman looking on to her daughter in the foreground. And it's sort of the idea of that, you know, process of the one generation passing on their skills to the next generation. And so, um, and, and so it's just, showing not only the importance of this skill for these women, but also just the, how, how it's a personal, um, there's a personal, personal sense of pride with it and that they, they choose to be very, you know, it's very, um, it requires a lot of skill, patience and tenacity to be able to do it. And so they, you know, it's, it becomes uh, their lifestyle and their, you know, way of life indefinitely um and I, I feel like he captures them so beautifully uh and i don't know if jack wants to continue on talking about this particular piece i think you're doing a great job <laughs> I, I don't know i'm happy to have you uh comment I, well, on it i feel like I, no, I, I i think i think that uh i'd like to devote my time more to speaking of the broader context of mexican art and okay. maybe feeling specifically rather than an individual work of art, because I think there's a bigger story here than uh, is anticipated. <laughs> well, then, I, th I, th I think that might be a good segue to go in. Well, unless you I mean, more, Christina. Well, I'm happy. I'm happy to pass the baton on to Jack if he'd like to make that segue uh, to continue the conversation uh -huh. on to uh, a broad. If you want to talk a broader stroke about ma uh, Mexican modernism and and the art market from your perspective, that would be great. Am I on then? <laughs> yes, you're on. You are. First, first let, let me just say that um, your generous introduction of me, uh, I, I wouldn't represent myself as someone very knowledgeable about Mexico. I've certainly traveled there. And my perspective is more in terms of the all too many decades that I've been doing this with great love and contextualizing Mexican art with European and American art. Um, when I first started dealing in art in the early 70s, yes, I'm 112, um, Mexican art was viewed, really. I mean, I don't want to insult anyone, but it was thought of as kind of der a derogatory term, uh, 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 indigenous art. Uh, you know, there were, Mexican art was segregated in a way that African art or Asian art, you know, there's a kind of elitism in this kind of Western European sensibility. And yet, in fact, from my perspective, and by the way, Mexican contemporary art was not considered at all. If they were contemporaries by incident, there were artists that were well-known, 
such as, of course, the, the, the masters of uh, uh, the mural. Tamayo was an exception. Cuevas was an exception. Toledo was an exception. And the reason was because they somehow were contextualized and blessed by the New York-centric art world and the Parisian world, the Europeans. So when we dealt with art, my experience was, of course, with the Siqueiros, Orozco, Rivera, and these various artists that I mentioned. And I, I think a great breakthrough in terms of Mexican contemporary art was when Sotheby's, through Marianne Martin, who became a formidable dealer in Mexican art, formed its Latin American department of, uh, at Sotheby's. And all of a sudden, there was direct focus on an entire region of the world that was not assimilated. We knew people like uh, Mata and Alfredo Lam, but from a Parisian perspective, from a French uh, surrealist and even American uh, uh, context. So I think it's really important to, to recognize it. And yet from the, what I have learned uh, in, in my little world, and I, I don't think any dealer has a, a, a real uh, lock on a perspective. We have many viewpoints, you know, the elevated one, the one from the ground, the one from afar. But from what I see, the Mexican modernists, the Mexican moderns and contemporaries uh, up until let's say the 70s, their intellectual nourishment came more from Europe than from America. Mexican artists informed American modernists, you know, uh, Siqueiros was uh, Jackson Pollock's assistant. Uh, he made uh, murals in, in uh, frescoes in Los Angeles. Uh, New York, other places, but I find it really interesting. It's this crisscrossing back and forth of the exchange that I find most fascinating. Uh, I did an exhibition called um, Artists of Mexico, and it was done in conjunction with the Getty Museum's Pacific Standard Time, LALA, LALA standing for Los Angeles and Latin America. Out of that entire uh, multi million dollar endeavor, the only thing that was left out was the real history of Los Angeles and Mexico. You can't even imagine, unless you've really studied this, how much Mexico impacted Los Angeles artists and vice versa. Mexico, in fact, was the Côte d'Azur of America. You have to remember before the jet age, artists were going to Mexico as the most exotic uh, port in a sense. Uh, Europe was not that accessible and yet Paris of course was the big magnet. But when you talk about the surrealists going to Mexico, when you talk about the abstract, Siqueiros taught in Los Angeles. Hmm? Artists like um, oh, Montoya uh, uh, had his first exhibitions in Los Angeles. Uh, Los Angeles was a draw because of the film world. So artists came here looking for work. But in any case, uh, I, I, think, I think there's a much richer history that can be mined. What I'm concerned with, uh, and it concerns me not just of Mexico, but all uh, contemporary art from other parts of the world, is there is a kind of internationalism that is happening today. And Mexico with its extraordinary culture, uh, uh, the indigenous culture and traditions, the uh, desire to be part of the international language, I think oftentimes artists have lost their own indigenous voice and which informs the work. So I'm particularly taken with artists who have the ability to not only speak an international language, but it is very deeply informed from a personal experience and cultural history. Um, I still would submit that uh, in, in, in Mexico, the German expression has had more impact than the Impressionist did uh, or the American abstract expressionist did or some other uh, sort of cultures. I've had the pleasure 
an honor of representing the Francisco Zuniga estate. And, um, you know, Zuniga for one was so well read about German expressionism. His heroes were people like uh, Barlock, Kolwitz, uh, Pechstein, Kirchner, and above all, um, the uh, works of Gauguin. And so you, you have many directions that inform these artists. And uh, the one thing that I would say is that uh, there is great political pressure, both to stifle and to be part of something larger. And the thing that distinguishes great artists are their unique voices, not to be part of a stew. And that's what's somewhat happening in the internationalization of the art world. I would like to go to Mexico and see things that are uniquely extraordinary, but transcend cultural boundaries to where I feel somehow a connection. And I would say the same about every country. I've had a great deal of experience, uh, for example, with the art of Ireland, which incidentally is something to discover about the relationships between Ireland and Mexico. Both have a profound Catholic history and uh, which has also informed a great deal of the aesthetic direction. So I'll, I'll leave it there for now because I can probably go on about two or three more hours. <laughs> So questions are better than me going on a bit. Uh, 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 Christina, that might be a good time to uh, bring Linda in. Well, no, I was actually going to suggest maybe we you you want to talk to do you want to talk to Jesus? Um, have Jesus? Oh yeah, that that might be a good idea. Okay, so let's let's do this. Um, Jesus, you were introduced to me by Suleiman Elizondo, who we've represented in the past and continue to um, champion. And um, she brought us to the attention of you. And I looked at your website and looked at the, 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 the presentation and was extremely impressed with um, the variety of media that you represent and also the kind of inclinations. There's not, it, it's like when you look at some galleries, you see a style in your gallery, you don't see a style, you just see a strong commitment, aesthetic commitment to various different things. And if I look at the, if I look at the, um, let's see, I was looking at your gallery and looking at your artists and I, I mean, your exhibitions, that's that page. And I, you know, it's just striking if you just take a look, Rose, Rose Kalal is completely, uh, completely different to uh, Fernanda Caballero and Aldo Chaparro, and uh, and and yet again completely different from Louise Hampshire and and uh, Carlos Garcia Noriega. So maybe talk to us a little bit about your perspective when it comes to the kinds of things that um, <clears throat> that um, Jack was speaking about in that. Christina and Alex were speaking about in terms of general overall perspective. Oh, I think you're muted. Oh, the microphone. Yeah. There you go. Click on unmute. Oh, you're still muted. You need it. Let's see. Let me do it. Let me see if I can do it for you. Uh, there you go. Okay. You're, you should be, a, we should be able to hear you. Hello? There you go. Good. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, thank you. Um, it will it kind of be very um, long to 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 respond to that particular question of it because, of course, I'm a kid of the '80s, and um, even though all of the uh, the history of in, in Mexico and all of that, uh, we travel a lot. Internet was in the in the mid nineties in my school. And um, of course the nineties here in Monterrey was uh, like, a, like a bloom of contemporary art. Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, our own contemporary art museum uh, has only 25 years. Uh, so yeah, it, I mean, we're a city of 
400 years, but our museum is, 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 is only in, in diapers. So we have to look beyond um, our own city to, to, to have a look of everything. Mexico City, Guadalajara, of course, uh, we're very close to Texas. So Houston, uh, Austin, Texas, San Antonio, of course, uh, traveling to other art fairs and Miami and Los Angeles, New York City, all of that implicates a lot of uh, like <laughs> all of this stuff that we see uh, day by day. Um, there's a particular thing, I don't know if you, Yuri, can, 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 can show, or can I, can I show my, my, uh, I think Laura, you might be able to direct Laura to, to, to show it to you, or Laura, you can make her, his screen shareable. Because it's, you might, it's I think there's a green share screen on yours, on the bottom of yours, you could, you probably might have that. Okay. Well, th th that's the particular project that we're on here right now, Collector, uh, that we just had one year. Uh, all these ex first exhibitions is for um, the program for one year. But I have a previous project called KRSTO Crystal. That was yeah, why don't, um, why don't, see, uh, do you have a green button at the bottom of your screen saying share screen? Yes. Okay, you can go ahead and do that. And then okay. type it into your browser, and then we'll and show us about the Christo thing. Yeah, I read about that. So you've had how long have your gallery has your gallery been open? Uh, one year. Oh, cool. cool. Yeah, we're like oh, that's fantastic. Six months open, and then six months close, and we're back right right on. <laughs> um, but I'm going to show you just particular two exhibitions that was held uh, a couple of years ago that the the Q well. I curated it in, in um, two different, the exhibitions were two different uh, venues, but it was some particular thing. This is Francisco Munoz. Uh, yes, of course. So share screen. Are we on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to show you this in particular, of course, with the timing. And this guy I met in Madrid two years ago, even though he's Mexican as well I am, and he's living in Mexico City. But when I met him uh, traveling in Madrid, then he told me that he was going to do an artist residency in Paris um, that, um, that summer. Uh, and then travel with him to Paris and look at what was going on. He was uh, well. Maybe you can you can read a bit of that. Is is uh, the skinning to the reborn, uh, and it is uh, uh, it's the Tlaxcaltecas that uh, were beaded by the old Olmec uh, civilization. But um, he all these tapestries. There is of course if there's. Uh, acrylic on linen, but um, this particular uh, cultural practice of them to, to this team, um, the, the animals that they consume, uh, having all four colors, the white of the stones, the black of the charcoal, uh, and the, well, three colors, and the green of the vegetation. So, I made this exhibition on my last um, gallery that was K Square. And we wanted to show the people uh, about the pre-colonization in Mexico that was still going on in contemporary Mexican art. Uh, this was the whole exhibition it was, I'm guessing it's 12 fabrics hanged on there. And at the same time, uh, in another venue was Angelbert Metoyer. He's an African American um, born in Louisiana. That's because of his name is like uh, French um, predecessors. And um, was this because showing the pre-Columbian and 
pre-colonization uh, or post-colonization with all this uh, African people coming to the States for slaves. And with him, he has a really strong history because I think her, his great grandmother was in her zone, uh, was the one to uh, establish or, or held a, a, a small revolution in her zone in Louisiana to, to end slavery, of course. And so we have these two shows at the same time. Uh, having this culture of Africans in Louisiana, you know, all this magic, black magic, and, uh, but also there are two different cultures. Um, one native Mexicans, the Las Caltecas, and the Africans that came over to America. Uh, so I know this is not answering your question, Yuri, but uh, you're my, you're, this, this is actually, um, I think this touches very closely on what Jack was talking about as well, which is the internationalization of culture. But what, what we're exhibiting, what we're seeing here is a, is a gathering together of, the, of various influences based on birth and based on you know, location and environment. And that's what's really great about what you're showing. Um, I think um, this is really super cool. Um, these two shows happened when? It was uh, one, it's, it's held like, uh, we have a gallery weekend, uh, one week pre preview, Prius B Maco uh, Art Fair in Mexico City. So Guadalajara, Monterrey, uh, we held this uh, art weekend before or every people that's coming from other places in the world to Mexico City and their assistants uh, go to the fair and, and build everything. They come here or Guadalajara to, to know what's going on. So and this, was the this was the last full version of that show, right? Yeah. And uh, just to have a little bit of what was Jack saying about um, Mexicans, you know, the, 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 the muralists, uh, after them, you know, Juan O'Gorman or uh, Matias Goritz uh, uh, that came to, to Mexico to experiment this like German or, or Bauhaus movement, some, some, some sort of it. Uh, with this artist, Marco Treviño, that is from Monterrey also. We had a presentation of this mural in the La Consulate in Paris last uh, summer. Uh, he made this font uh, typography. I don't know if you can see it well. Uh, this mural is a pocket mural. So we have this in a box with just two geometries. This is the C and the A that uh, the past governments uh, in Mexico, it's CONARTE. It's the, like the Secretary of Arts and Culture in Mexico. So this was the logo of uh, the past administration. So he did with these two uh, geometries, he did this typography. So um, he wanted to do like a mural that also was like very fragile. This is Tyvek. The Tyvek is a fabric, like a paper to, uh, that we can uh, grab uh, with, with a lot of care, the, the art pieces. And um, the mural says uh, 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 an answer that Cicados, when he was asked 40 years ago, 50 years ago about what was going on that that time that was contemporary and that with this time he, he was just uh, answering that every contemporary artist was ahead of, of his time and, and the next contemporary was going to be ahead of that particular time. So even though the piece is, it was held two years ago, I mean, I think it's mag magnificent <laughs> uh, because of it. And uh, I was just, 
for me, it's very important to to do it because this artist is, I guess, he's, he's like 31 years old, and he has this resemblance to what was going on 40, 50 years ago, and just tried to put it again. Um, also, my generation we all go into glo the globalization, internationalization. It's very fast and very simple doing Instagram. So even though you're living in a town far away, you can be with a lot of exposure and be in the pop culture. And having that um, kind of been taking away or I, I don't know, if, there's a lot of ideas coming out in my, my, on my mind right now, but uh, with him being born in the 90s and then having history back again, even though we're citizens of the world, uh, for me, was very, very unique. Yeah, I, I think that is, um, that might be a good, um, this is really wonderful. This is a really great way to tie mural culture and communication uh, together, which is essentially what all art is about. Um, I think maybe it's a good idea, Christina, if we bring in um, Linda, because um, she, Linda has a lot of back and forth between uh, cultures in a way. Um, what do you think? Um, I That's was actually what I was going to suggest as well, because um, there are a couple things that Jesus, I'm sorry, Christina, I didn't mean to interrupt you. There are a couple things that Jesus, you, um, you showed us that Linda, your work actually correlates to pretty, um, pretty well so uh christina yeah let's uh hey hey uh uh jesus let's unshare your screen real quick yeah and then we can show um that was fantastic by the way and then and then alex or christina can show uh the work that we wanted to show of, of linda's and then after that we'll there you go and then we'll and then we'll we'll finish with Suleiman Sulema, elizondo but let's talk let's look at uh, linda's work Definitely, just a moment. Here we go. Okay. Oh wow! I see that. I see. I see. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. So I was thinking about this piece. Um, in addition to the pocket mural, which I think is probably one of my favorite things I've heard all day, pocket mural. Um, and uh, also in addition to Francisco Munoz. So. Um, Linda, please go ahead and give us um, and give us your thoughts about about your work and and the diaspora and all of those interesting things. Well, first, I'd like to say how much I'm enjoying today's conversation. Uh, it's always wonderful to talk about Mexico and the United States and Europe all in one breath. To talk about traditional culture and the indigena to talk about the concepts of accepted and not accepted, the influences between the multiple worlds and how we can all gain from it. Because uh, I pretty much uh, spent many years now uh, visiting throughout Europe and also all throughout Mexico and uh, discovering indigenous America uh, in very intimate ways in the United States and in Mexico as well. Um, it's really been edifying for me to hear everyone speaking. Jack's always incredible. I could listen to him for hours on end. I think maybe that's the next talk you should do because I think we could all <laughs> learn a great deal. Um, these are from a series of pieces that were actually born out of a, 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 a about 10 years of work based on uh, the concept of Brown. And that's why I mentioned, you know, accepted, not accepted, how Mexican art was not accepted by the greater world for many years and how difficult it's been for contemporary Mexicanos and contemporary Chicanos to be included in the conversation about international arts and the art market. These are called Datos Sagrados and they come out of a, a series called Make Them All Mexican where I bought pricey antiques and painted their skin brown to turn history and culture on its head. Basically a conversation about the politics of culture and class then I decided to keep it brown. That was my phrase. So what are you doing lately, Linda? I'm keeping it brown, talking about the politics of color and class. And I began a series called the Brown Dot Project in which I tracked uh, US Latino data onto architectural grid paper using brown dots, where the number of dots actually exemplified 
or uh, mathematically, uh, cor correct mathematically, correctly in a mathematical formula presented data. And Data Sagradas was the next iteration of the, of the data work. Uh, this particular piece is on handmade paper from India and gouache, hand painted uh, gouache and uh, uh, pencil. Uh, this particular uh, data pictograph, if you will, uh, represents the fact that 47.7% of US Latino households are married households. And this is in 2015, this is data from 2015, created in 2017. To give you an idea of how it functions, I draw out the um, mandalic formula, which is a very interesting uh, formula when you consider uh, the pyramids that we were looking at earlier, a, a lot of indigenous uh, weaving uh, as we looked at the Diego Rivera drawing as well. It is uh, indicative of um, uh, several different kinds of mathematic formulas. I mean, we discussed the idea that the Maya were uh, astronomers, uh, excellent astron astronomers and mathematicians. So in this case, I, do, I make a drawing by hand on the circular formula that may have 100 areas in it. Let's just say that for numerical value, 100. So in that case, I would paint 48 of those areas brown in different shades of brown to, uh, to create a pictograph which exemplifies the factual data that 47.7% of US Latino households are married households. I produced about, I don't know, maybe uh, 40 or 50 of these and the Brown Dot Project, I produced several of those as well. The data is just fascinating. I'm doing a lot of data study these days. This is a smaller piece. The one we saw before is 24 inches in diameter. This one's 12 inches in diameter. And this is uh, Datos Sagrados, 64% uh, of US Latinos are Mexican. Um, in the United States, that's like two thirds of all Latinos in the United States are Mexican, followed by Puerto Ricanos and Cubanos and Centroamericanos. But as we all know, the history of the Southwest, Tejanos, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, and California uh, was pretty much Nuevo Mexico. And I've been doing a great deal of study in the history of the railroads. And I found out recently that um, 70,000 to 100,000 Mexicanos, uh, Mexican Americans and Tejanos were on the work in the railroads uh, in, in the late 19th century. So we really were a part of the making of, of, of the United States. Again, in this particular case, if there's a hundred spaces, then 64 of those will be painted in a shade of brown or a shade of red, if you'll allow me, uh, exemplifying the factual data that 64% of US Latinos are Mexican in 2015, produced in 2017. Very, very cool. Um, uh, yeah, let's see some more of these. These are really cool. This is the next series that came up after that, the Sagrados, uh, where I just wanted to keep painting. I had been making brown dots with a magic marker on architectural grid paper for a few years, <laughs> painting brown on, uh, on uh, figurines from all over the world for a few years. And I really missed paper and I really missed paint and I really missed the that aspect of the studio. This is about uh, 22 by 33. It's about the size, 22, uh, 32 by, by 15, about the size of a sheet of art, just maybe slightly larger. And it's from a series called Cultural Enigma. And what I decided to do was to continue using the gouache on the handmade paper and the pencil to um, take um, uh, symbols, signs and symbols from all over the world, actually. Some of them are European, some of them are Egyptian, some of them are archaic, many of them are Mexican. Uh, many of them are Mesoamerican uh, symbols and signs that are very well known in uh, our architectural sites all over the world that have been used many, many times and asking people, do you know where this comes from or what the symbol means? It's the idea, is culture of any importance? Do we need culture? Is culture of value in our daily lives? Do you know anything about culture? Have you studied culture? Do you know anything about history? Do you know your own history? Is it of interest to you? And just all these questions. And that's why I called the series Cultural Enigma, uh, in this case, Untitled si Symbols and Signs from 2019. You recognize this symbol? This is one of my favorites. This is the next one is one of my favorites. This is one of my favorites. Uh, yeah. Uh, it took quite some time to draw actually the formula because many of these architectural uh, formulas that you can find on buildings all over the world are, are, are mathematical formulas and it's difficult to draw them by hand. And this actually is a symbol that's very well known all over the world and is used by many different cultures, indigenous cultures, 
from all over the world, traditional cultures, ancient cultures from all over the world. And of course I've, I've painted it, you know, the brown, the brown, the bleeding brown, <coughs> continuing with the shades of brown to discuss the politics of color and class, the meaning and the value of Mexican culture, the meaning and the value of indigenous culture. Uh, does anybody know what this, this, uh, this blue line is a symbol for? Serpent. That's one of them. Good God. Good job. Waves. Water. Excellent. Water. Excellent. Yeah. I have asked this question to groups of people uh, for the last two years since it first got exhibited in 2019, and no one recognizes this symbol. This must be one of the most basic symbols in all, in, in all of uh, uh, the language of symbols that's such a part of the history of so many cultures, including, Mexi including the Mexicano culture. And I was always shocked that people didn't recognize the serpent and didn't recognize the water. I think yeah. because it can be so broadly interpreted, it, you know, it, it means so many different symbols, so many different things that everybody fails to recognize that it is something as simple as a serpent or as water. Do we look for symbol? Do we include in symbol? I would ask audiences, how many people here have any insignia on their body? Does anyone wear any insignia? Uh, you know, tattoos are a form of contemporary insignia. How many of us include signs and symbols to remind us of culture, our culture, other cultures, the combination of cultures, the, the, uh, the influence of one culture into the other in our homes? I mean, as artists and dealers and gallerists and uh, people who really care about art, we're surrounded by it all the time. And I think that's one of the great things that we love about art. Certainly one of the things that I care about deeply. Well, I think I think that that um, that is really a great way to to talk about Sulamit Elizondo's work. Um, if you could, Laura, if you could bring up the Sula, Sulamit's uh, website, and uh, Sulamit's in her studio in um, Monterey, Mexico now, and she's got a piece behind her that's being done. Hey, Suli, what's happening? Hey. So this series you're looking at now. Is there, the, the, talk to us about this um, Hermana Lobo, Hermano Hermana Lobo. Lobo. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say, Linda, I love the way you talk. You just, you know, you, the conversation with you just flows right in. I, I, I'm, I, th I hope mine flows as well, but I love to hear you talk. I wish I could, you know, listen to you for hours. Very kind of you. Thank you. Uh, Hermano Lobo comes in as a, I wanted to represent the male side of, uh, you know, of, of a, our dichotomy. Either, I mean, both female and males have their male side and their female side. You know, we, even in, uh, in medicine, uh, Chinese medicine or alternative medicine sees, see the body and it's, divided in a quadrant down right in the half and there is a feminine side and a masculine side. And we need to um, recognize both parts and integrate them to, to be whole. So part of my work goes back to wholeness, to well-being, to recognizing who we really are. And my work stems from just trying to decipher who I am, I guess very narcissistic it's um it's trying to it, in a way i'm i guess i'm getting to know myself more and more as as i keep on you know working and painting and seeing what else i need to find and hopefully somebody else sees himself mirrored in it and and likes it so yeah that that's how wolves began it, they began starting in my dreams and these wrestlers all filled with mud and so I went to a uh, wolf sanctuary in Novo Mexico to take pictures and to be with them a while and to understand them and I was amazed I had no idea of the particularities they have you know what and I guess it was a it was a way to understand all other animals we would study wolves at school and they would have these particular uh, characteristics and then once I was with them in that sanctuary and I got to know them through the keeper she made me see things about them so different than what I'm used to I mean 
they are like human beings. One of them is completely different from the other, especially if they've been through trauma, they have PTSD and they, they're, they have, they're so you know, specific in their, in their personalities, which I loved. And I also went to look for uh, wrestling festivals with mud all, all around the world. And I found that there was one in Korea at the time I was doing this, so I went over there and I took the pictures and, and that's where the wrestlers come, um, come through. So can you, can you um, why don't you point out one of these paintings for us to look at um, as an example? Um, how about if we scroll down to the, to the, let's show a couple of the wolves together and a couple of the wrestlers and see how that, how we can talk about that. Okay. That one is great. So this, talk to us about this, this work. Okay, so, you know, when, when people see my work, they, they, they're like historians or they're like, uh, like if I'm sitting at the, at the office of a therapist and they see it and they want to understand why I wanted to paint wolves with their teeth and with their gnarls and why are they really fighting or are they, or are they playing and and they see my life and they try to put it together oh she's going through this and maybe that's why this is, this is what she painted and truthfully I only followed I mean what would I what really you know drew me in and at that moment in my life I wanted to see the fangs and I wanted to to be disorienting between playfulness or aggressiveness, you know, territorialism or just friendly, you know, playful. Um, so that's one of the pieces and most of them have, you know, their teeth out. And there's one specifically where one is, is growling and the other one is yawning. And you have to uh, see their, their expression in a total way to understand which is different from the other. But it's kind of like putting polar opposites together, always showing how we need both parts, you know, to be the whole. And then these are, yeah, that's the, the fighters, the wrestlers, yeah, both with mud. And, you know, Koreans, may, Men, Korean men are so different from, for example, Americans. Um, men in America, in, in the US, you know, they keep their distance. You can't really touch each other because that means, you know, that disrespectfulness or whatever. And in Korean men, they are really, you know, they're, they touch each other and it doesn't mean anything. It just means that, you know, they're comrades and they, they're friends. And they say to each other, hey, I like the way you look today and look at my hair and how it shines. And you have this other culture of expression that is so much open, which I really like. And so here at the, at the festival, there was specifically these two who, who took a long time to decide who was really gonna be the dominant one because they were just enjoying that and I, and I enjoyed it and so that's why I, it it's it's a very it's a very unique com com I mean I don't think I've ever seen combinations of subject matter put together like this in one body of work, and that was the thing that drew me to your work in the first place because the very first series that I showed of your work were these monumental paintings in San Pedro called um, oh that's gorgeous um, the the ones where it was all about um, a sense of home, a sense of danger about home. And you, you find a way to um, combine what normally people might consider disparate subject matters together in a very unique way. Um, and the paintings have abstract qualities that are quite wonderful in every one of them. Um, as, uh, tell us about this one. So this is the only female that I painted. She, she was 
doing a, a what's it called? A non roller, how do you know? Marometa. Meeting you're attending or something? It's a Zoom on art. It's okay. Oh, okay. Um, and <laughs> they filled with, with uh, mud all around her body. And it, it was just, you really couldn't tell if she was female or male, if she was just, you know, in the moment, enjoying that moment. And that's why, I mean, this piece is stands by itself in, in that show. It, and I just, I have, I, it, I had like heart and meaning to me at that moment, you know, of being present, of, of enjoying the moment, of going back into the mud, grabbing into even, you know, parts that you want other people to see, the, the messy, the unclean, and being okay with it. Um, so uh, show us a little bit about, tell us, uh, before we go, tell us about the painting behind you. That's the newest, one of your newest pieces? Yes, this is one of my newest pieces. It's, it, it goes back to one of the first series I did called Nenufares, which also talks about mud and it, it's the nenufar is the, the lotus flower that puts its roots down, deep down into the mud and transforms that into that beautiful white flower and this piece is is uh, both polar the, the you know the light part of a personality and the dark part of, of a personality and how we literally do not like to show you know, that, that darkness, and, but it's still part of us, and it talks about that integration of, of the whole and becoming, you know, um, loving that part and being able to show it, not being perfect and being okay with it. Perfect in the sense of what we, you know, as a society call perfect, just. Yeah, you know. yeah. And it has encaustic paint and it has mixed media and, yeah. Cool. Um, well, this, this, as far as I'm concerned, this has been an incredible tour around the country. Um, Christina, Alex, do you want to add anything? Um, because I feel like we've really, I feel like we've really touched on some really, like the chain, the circle of this conversation that we've had, all these links have connected throughout this conversation that we've had. And it's I do think we have really a couple questions, but aside from that, I have, I have a few questions. I also would just like to add the fact that we have this art world experience talking about Mexico and filling in Mexico, trying to embody and, and cover the entire Mexican art history in an hour is, is really impressive. Um, I, I think it was a good, good feat uh, on our part. I mean, starting from, thir you know, 330 uh, to to present day is is quite uh, quite extensive. Um, I mean, we we did a good job of covering uh, pre-Columbian, Spanish colonial, and uh, then kind of skipped on to modernism. And I know that Heather, you had a question about the surrealists, and I was going to say, well, I could easily have spent the entire time talking about modernism and surrealism myself. So my problem is, is that I don't have a off button when it comes to those <laughs> topics. So surrealist artists, I mean, we could talk about, um, you know, Diego Rivera's wife, Frida Kahlo, who to me was, you know, an iconic surrealist as well as Leonora Carrington, um, who I loved and sort of met, I would say, or was introduced to when I studied Max Ernst and, and studied their relationship as well and how, she was, um, you know, she was abandoned by Max Ernst in Germany in 1940 when he flew off for, with uh, Peggy Guggenheim. And, um, and the sad thing is, is that she was for the longest time recognized only as his girlfriend and not really as an artist in her own right. And I feel like now she's finally getting that moment. And a lot of these surrealist, female surrealist stars are finally getting that moment. So I just wanted well, to- I was just saying, I thought that they, um, they did have a lot of influence on the, Surreal, the Mexican artists, I mean, the, the filmmakers, the photographers, you know, they, they were really, there's a lot of exchange of ideas going on. You know, Absolutely. The realists. Absolutely. And I know, I know their, their that, importance really can't be understated. It's, it's yeah. really just 
um, you know, when you when you when you really start, you know, you're thinking about Lola Alvarez Bravo and things like that. I mean, you yeah, really start um, to um, again, Christina said it, I could say it. We we can all talk about this all day long. <laughs> we're, we're really in the infancy in and our understanding and knowledge of Mexican true. art. I mean, you have to remember the very first museum exhibition in America, major museum exhibition didn't happen until the 1940s. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, you know, it wasn't until the 80s that Mexican contemporary art was even integrated in America. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of revisionist history and it's rather dangerous. I mean, no one really cared about Frida Kahlo in those early years. I mean, she was, there were exceptions of course, but this is a new world of icons and phenomena and celebrity. And we have to really resist the seduction of celebrity and really pare it down to individual voice and the contributions that they've made and they will make. But for now, we're just part of a process. And I think truth is always with a very small T and it keeps changing and evolving. We ain't seen nothing yet, as Al Jolson used to say. I would agree. Um, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Um, Alex, anything else? Christina, anything else? Yes, Mylene had a had a question. Um, she wanted to know, Jack and um, artists and gallerists, do you do you consider indigenous art a contemporary art? I mean, when I was speaking to her, I mentioned that uh, you know I really do consider indigenous art. You know, the ones that are made within those communities that are small and insular. Um, I really do consider that a contemporary art form, certainly because it's it's being made at this moment of this moment, but um, a lot of them also don't necessarily consider the artwork. Um, a lot of them consider the artwork as, as sort of a practical means to create beauty in their own lives. So it has, it has less of a, I'm going to include this in the art world and the greater Mexican art canon as a whole, but something that is very personal and deeply deeply felt um, as, you know, with, with at a much smaller, or not smaller, but a much, um, a much more intimate scale and level. So um, if you guys could speak to that really fast, that would be, um, Mylene, I know I would appreciate it as well. <laughs> I, I actually think that we have to make a distinction. The word art has become all too encompassing. Um, you know, today people make uh, art by virtue of declaration, not by execution. Um, exactly. <laughs> we have to distinguish art in its intent. One, you know, when you look at pre-Columbian art, it wasn't made for a broader uh, uh, recognition. It was tribal, it was ceremonial, it was purposeful within that little community. We have a modern sensibility today. It's a different perspective. And, you know, I'm, I'm drawn to one incredible exhibition that I, I did of Francisco Zuniga, and it was a monumental show, huge sculptures and drawings, and yeah, even as rarely known paintings on canvas. And I remember a Korean dealer brought in a, a, a client that wanted to share something, not Zuniga, but she walked in and she saw this artist that she never heard of, Zuniga. She pulls me aside and said to me, is he Asian? A client told me the day, day before, you know, I sat with my family and we we're looking at old images, turn of the century, late 19th century images of my uh, Ukrainian grandmother with the reboso, you know, the, she was, uh, well, she wasn't wearing a reboso, she was wearing a, a, a blanket, a scarf over her head. And she said, they look just like my Ukrainian grandmother. My FedEx guy comes in and he says, wow, and this FedEx was, was a black uh, gentleman. And he said, wow, this artist really has my people down. So here's an artist who has devoted himself exclusively almost to, to celebrating the indigenous Mexican Indian woman, the indigenous woman, not because of a narrative, but because of this broader sense of knowing and this archetype. These are the true earth mother and virtually every 
continent in this world collects Francisco Zuniga because we can all relate to him on a personal level. And I think that is often what is missing in art because they become either a look at me, look at me scenario where uh, artists are not interested in reaching uh, a broader level. And I don't think they should be working towards that, but where their language transcends cultural and national boundaries. So uh, forgive me, I've gone on a bit again. <laughs> but I think I think I, I think that's just again what I was trying to say as well though is that it it serves a, a very that you know, those indigenous cultures some of them serve a, a very kind of private purpose a, a purposeful object and it's not necessarily for mass consumption the way that a lot of um, contemporary artists operate today so I th I think that you you put it a little bit more neatly than I was able to. I was just gonna inject that some, something along the lines of that it was just the idea and thank you Jack for, for your comments. I mean, that's a very point you said. I mean, I was just thinking when I think of indigenous culture specifically to Mexico, I immediately think of Rufino Tamayo and sort of how that part of his personal experience with, with being half indigenous, it's sort of, it was what, it was part of what influenced his his artwork, his entire, you know, his body of work to begin from start to finish. And he he was always drawn to it. And so I feel like it was very something that was very personal, very intimate. And there was a lot of like a lot of the symbolism was kind of reverting back to reverting back to that part of his culture. And um, and I mean, I mean, not that it's in Mexico, but I just I mean, like I'm thinking of other artists that have have similar sort of a mixed backgrounds where they they themselves, you know, part in indigenous where they also incorporate that into their artwork and it becomes part of their identity not only as an artist but as an individual so yeah i, I think um, i think linda and um Sully have both eloquently expressed their own <clears throat> their own deep dive into that situ into that idea or practice and uh, so if, if either of you or jesus want to say something about this this would be a good time Sulamit, tienes ahí las fotos. You have the photographs of the exhibition we uh, we did in the university a couple of years ago. I I think I do somewhere, but I I wouldn't know how to share the screen. Okay, there's a little green button at the bottom. Okay, so I'm I'm, I'm gonna first uh, quickly just this university was uh, made by well the, the campus is the the art arts and architecture um, the department of all, all the students go, go there and uh, it has only like six years um, now the, the 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 building and it was designed by Tadao Ando and. Um, uh, we had the opportunity to, to, to present a couple of, of uh, alumni that, uh, because both Sulamit and me in, uh, went to college there, and uh, it's a great, great building, wonderful, uh, all concrete, and uh, Sulamit held their solo exhibition that was really wonderful, and I don't know if we can share that for a moment. Well, it, it had those actually those those paintings the the wolf and the and the, uh, the guys yes forcing each other yes um I'll try to look for them. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have a question for you for Jesus yeah. regarding the gallery. Um, being that you have now been open six months or not really open six months during COVID, how are you, how, how is it now sort of dealing with artists and exhibitions and-, well, and well, the first question is like, um, how do you handle artists? That, that was the most difficult part of it because, uh, We've been working nonstop. Uh, of course, we haven't been able to hold exhibitions or to bring a lot of people, but we've been working uh, all these months, reconfiguring and restructuring everything. All the exhibitions went to 2021. I have one right now that opened yesterday 
Um, but uh, yeah, the, the real point here was to handle our roast artists, the, 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 the entire list, because there was a bunch of people that had sufficient funds to live with or not, or, you know, all of that thing was just the difficult part of it. Uh, because also the sales, I don't know, people, businesses went down, but other people, other businesses of other people went up also, and they, they had uh, uh, money to, 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 to buy pieces. So it wasn't that, that difficult uh, for us uh, just to handle artists and canceling exhibition. There was just like... Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, and uh, we moved uh, the, 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 the whole calendar uh, to next year. Uh, but in this, in, in this particular project, Collector is uh, for collaborating with other galleries, um, bringing international artists uh, to, to the city. And also the other project, KRSTO Crystal, is to uh, bring Mexican artists abroad so that, that, that's that's the meaning of it may i respond to the indigenous question please please sure. by all means may i um okay um i really liked what jack had to say again uh and uh, with his uh comparison and uh in regard to the relationship between indigenous and traditional cultures and the world, and the idea that Zuniga could be producing images that are really indicative of his love and his compassion and his dedication to Mexican indigenous women. And then how indigenous, those in images of indigenous women could be taken on and appreciated by and loved by people from all walks of life and all over the world. This is one of the real reasons why I was drawn to Indigena to begin with, because I believe that it is, a, I, I believe very strongly that it is an international language in its own way because traditional cultures have so much in common together. Um, symbology, uh, belief systems, uh, traditions, ceremonial, cultural elements, and uh, it makes it possible to learn a language that allows you to speak to many people from many different parts of the world on many different levels. Um, when you look at me uh, as a Mexican American, my parents were born in the United States, but my grandparent, my grandfathers were born in Mexico. I'm third generation Californian. Uh, I still have indigena blood and you can see it in me and it's recognized by everyone that I come in contact with. And it's a source of pride and joy for me. And uh, I think it's important uh, for me personally, but I think it's also important for Mexicanos uh, and Mexican-Americans, Chicanx, Latinx, to accept and to relish their connection to uh, traditional cultural and ancient language. Thank you. That was, Thank you. That, is, that, is, that was quite eloquent as well. Yeah. Um, this, this, this has been, um, <clears throat> the most interesting art world show we've had so far. And I'm biased because we did one about Estonia a while back. And this has gone on longer than all the others. And it feels like it's only been happening for 15 minutes, which is fantastic. So I'm gonna personally thank everyone. Uh, you know, all the hosts, Alex and uh, Christina, Linda Vallejo, Jesus, Sulamit, of course, the inimitable Jack Rutberg, and to Ohm Bleicher and Laura, who's behind the scenes along with Izzy and everybody else helping us pull this off. Um, Christina, Alex, got anything you want to sign off with? Um, Muchas gracias por acompañarnos aquí en México. Great. Sí. Gracias a todos um, y ojalá que lo podamos conocer un día uh, en persona. So we, uh, you know, hopefully en vivo. all in person at some point soon once this virus is behind us because um, this was an absolute pleasure and I feel I could 
spend days, as I said before, talking about Mexico and Mexican art and culture. Mm -hmm. so thank you all. Thank you, uh, thank you everyone for allowing us to, to bring your work to the world. Mil gracias.